way that way that we can make things happen. Um, lastly, in our Concordia University system, we have a system that that trains uh, from from early childhood through elementary, through secondary, through high school, through college. We train our teachers to go out and teach in those schools. But today, uh, our system is no longer the primary system for producing teachers for Lutheran Church Missouri Synod schools. As a matter of fact, my home school in Chester, Illinois, about half the faculty now um, they they're Methodist because we aren't producing enough Lutheran school teachers through our Concordia system. So as I look at those questions, you know, there's a, a multitude of answers to why the decline in membership. Uh, it's not unusual for a young person to say to me, I don't believe in organized religion. And uh, we're seeing that happen more and more as we uh, leave the modern age and go into the postmodern age. Uh, Reggie McNeil has a book out, this present future that compares churches to clubs where the members you join, you pay your dues, you go through certain rituals, and uh, there's less meaning for younger people. I'm about the median age for membership of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I'm 56 years old, and I've been told the median age is anywhere between 56 and 62 years old which means the baby boomers, uh, maybe some of our grandchildren are starting to attend Lutheran schools, but, but uh, we don't see the young families that we used to have. Now, it, with the multitude of reasons, one of the big things I want to look at is, is the way we do the way we do school in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And, and you've all seen these organizational charts, whether you're in Lutheran school or public school, very top-down leadership. Um, today you can get computer programs that will you know, open up the chart and you just have to fill in the names. And uh, it's, it's done with positions in mind. Organizational charts also, oh, there's a little pointer here. Let me try that out. Organizational charts like that one from top down, you'll see a lot of those, whether Lutheran or public school. I'll compare it to a ladder approach. You work yourself from the bottom of the ladder and you work your way up. As a matter of fact, our schools are created that way, first grade, second grade, third grade. And uh, as you go up the ladder in schooling, you remember, remember in elementary school when the big kids were so cool because they were eighth graders, they were at the top of the ladder. And yet we know through research that uh, children don't learn at a first grade, second grade, third grade level. One day I walked into a second grade class and the teacher said to me, look at them. And she pointed to her class and, and I said, yeah. And she said, I have 16 students who are above second grade level. I have six students who are below second grade level. And I have two students who are at second grade level. And what kind of curriculum am I using? Second grade, which really was based on uh, learning for maybe two of her students. So. So this latter approach, it came out of, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes, came out of an industrial society. Our schools even tend to look like factories, the ones that were built in the 1930s with the big windows as we moved our, our kids through our school system. However, what we're seeing today is more, and I, and I would give the internet part of the credit, is this organic kind of a, a thing that's starting to happen. And where you really see it happen, happening are in some of those homeschooling circuits. And homeschooling works more with these organic kinds of groups that are springing up. And uh, I think there might be something to learn from it. Uh, many of you probably have friends via the internet and you hardly ever see them in person. And yet you're extremely uh, uh, conscious of of their support and uh, you stay in contact with them. Some of you probably write to them every day back and forth via via email or uh, instant messenger. Well, as we continue on, I just want to go back and forth and you've probably seen other, other uh, graphics like this. I just want to compare this modern industrial age, whatever you want to call it, that we've just been leaving and then take a look at a more of this postmodern type of information age. In the uh, modern industrial age, There we go. A lot of the latter was based on differences. You'll notice that I have a picture of a white male there who tends to be at the top of the ladder. Um, and boy, if we go back to uh, before the 1950s, we even had separate schools between blacks and whites and differences were, were uh, <clears throat> clearly emphasized and we had laws to, to enforce them. Now we're looking at postmodern information age and now we're starting to look in our classrooms and look for the likenesses among human beings. Uh, during the modern 
post-industrial age, uh, it was ba based on hierarchies and where you are on the ladder defines what your position is and how much power you will have. And obviously the idea was for everybody to work their way to the top of the ladder. Post-modern age, we're now information age. Boy, we are starting to do networks and networking. Um, well, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod is great for networking. As a matter of fact, you all that are in Dr. Jurgensen's class right now, you can pretty much throw out a name and, or a place, and he will be able to immediately say, oh, I know so-and-so who lives there. And I could do my Dr. J imitation, but I better keep going here with the presentation. Um, on this modern industrial age approach, conversation is for the upper hand. Where you are on the ladder um, it will give you knowledge is power. And so you want knowledge for the upper hand. And if you have a certain amount of knowledge that you know that's what gives you the power, you might not be uh, real willing to share it. I've even seen teachers in schools uh, with this ladder. And a fourth grade teacher has a great new idea for a method. And she closes her door. She doesn't want the other teachers using it. Uh, that's, that's, that's her thing. Well, in the uh, in postmodern information age, we are using conversation now for closeness. And uh, when you enter those kinds of schools where we see that happening, the doors are open, teachers are out in the hallways chatting with each other, sharing ideas. And uh, instead of the idea of don't use this idea, this is my idea for my classroom and not for yours. Uh, the industrial age, modern, the, the latter was preserving independence. And, and job descriptions are, are very, very uh uh, prevalent in this approach. Uh, that's not my job description, people will say. Over here in the postmodern information age, there's more emphasis on the idea of building community. And uh, some of you might be at schools, or, or I, I see this in Lutheran uh, elementary schools, I see it in public schools too, where there's a greater emphasis on uh, the community more than where you are on the ladder. Uh, modern industrial age, the emphasis was on competition and ironically cooperation depending on where you are on the ladder. If you're low on the ladder you might just need to cooperate and so the emphasis will be just cooperate, do what you're told uh, to work your way up the ladder. There will be greater emphasis on competing with one another as you work your way up. Collaboration is uh, where I really want to put some emphasis on this, this presentation to, tonight and uh, collaboration is it's not about competition it's not about cooperation it's putting the right people in the room together and uh, pooling their ideas and building off of one another's ideas and that's where the innovation comes um, mutuality and, uh, and, and a sense of wholeness which I'll talk about again in a little bit Within modern industrial age, uh, there was a limited amount of time and a limited amount of power. And limited time, uh, the example of an eight-hour workday. And that was it. You did your work, you went home, you were done. And a limited amount of power, depending, again, where you are on the ladder. Postmodern information age, uh, time's flexible. You know, I get emails sometimes from people at, at midnight, 1 a.m. As a matter of fact, you all send one to Dr. J and uh, see, you know, send one around midnight, see if you get a reply. Chance is pretty good, you just might, because he understands this flexible time kind of an idea. Uh, also, with the postmodern information age idea, uh, we're looking at as, as uh, flexible power, too. It's not like there's a limit on power. Um, power's, power is one of the things that probably has the least limits placed on it because it's, um, to some extent, artificial, made up by people. Now, it, some would say over here on this modern industrial age idea, and, and even in the slide I had earlier, that order is what's needed, and that's why we have those organization, organizational charts to see where we all fit on it to preserve order. While this old idea over here with all those circles and, and connections looks like chaos. Well, that too, ironically, is a philosophical discussion that's really quite interesting. The modern industrial age, uh, philosophically, it, it was influenced by, by all kinds of things, including science. And uh, science has a lot of order to it. Or does it? Because now that we're learning more and more about quantum physics, there's more and more attention being paid to chaos. And actually, chaos isn't completely chaos. There's a lot of growth that happens in chaos, and there are patterns that come out of chaos. Um, it just seems foreign to us if we're always seeing things in a linear way instead of a more of a geometric approach. 
Now, when I look at the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, it was an organic community when we were formed. And when we look at the first German enclaves, the first uh, settlers who came over here from Germany, uh, they settled in all kinds of different areas. What they had in common was their German language. However, there were all different kinds of, of Germans who came over. As a matter of fact, my marriage is a, a mixed marriage. I come from the, the Saxons who settled in Perry County, Missouri, and my husband uh, is from the uh, Hilgendorfs from Freistadt, Wisconsin, which were the Pomeranians. And, uh, and so in these different kinds of areas, uh, the, the Germans got together and formed their enclaves and, uh, and grew from there. Now, that doesn't mean that it was always perfect, by the way. Uh, there was also, there were all kinds of synods, the Buffalo Synod, the, uh, the L, uh, ALC, the Iowa Synod, the Missouri Synod, and, and people would jump between synods. And uh, so it's not because you were Missouri, you would always be Missouri. You, you might move to a different, different area and find yourself joining a different synod, or you might have a disagreement, which Lutherans are known to do, and all of a sudden you're going to leave one synod and create your own new synod which is rather an organic approach. Congregational authority is one of the uh, bedrocks of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. We don't have a huge hierarchy, and uh, that all goes back to our creation back in 1839 when uh, the first settlers came over. They had uh, originally chosen a man to be their bishop, but he fell from grace rather quickly. They this was the Perry County, Missouri Lutherans, and so they put him in a rowboat, put him on the Mississippi River, and said, <laughs> bye. And uh, because of that, we don't have huge hierarchy in our churches. The, the authority belongs to the congregations, which is more of an organic approach. Sam Seafeld has raised his hand. I just saw that. Hey, Sam Seafeld. Oh, question from Dr. J. Do you believe the top-down approach is inappropriate for all situations? Oh, yeah. He's going to argue with me on this, Sam. This is going to be fun. Or are there situations where it can be useful, especially in crisis situations where quick, strong decisions are necessary? Absolutely, Dr. J. Yes. In crisis situations, I would even argue that even in these, orga these uh, organic communities, there is somebody in that circle who is uh, bigger than life, which might just be you. And so, Dr. J, if you were part of this organic uh, community, yeah, you wouldn't be in the center of the circle. You'd be a member of the circle. But if there was a crisis situation, guess who everybody in that circle would look to? Because we know you would be the guy who would jump ahead, and we know that you have that ability. And each person who's part of this organic community brings certain kinds of gifts to the table. And uh, that is definitely one of your gifts, and anybody who knows you well knows that you're the guy that, that we would rely on for a quick, strong decision. How's that, Sam? Ah, I see a smiley face. All righty. Now, synod, by the way, uh, back here to the, orga the organic communities, the word synod means walking together. Now, that, again, sounds rather uh, like chaos with all these different kinds of bubbles, these circles all popping up. And so the way to help us kind of keep some order is our synod created Concordia colleges and seminaries, Concordia just like this one, and then there's nine others besides, and we have two seminaries for teacher pastor training. So out of these organic communities, there is an educational system that actually ties all of us together. And besides that, we also have what's called Concordia Publishing House. House, which uh, publishes a lot of our, our um, a lot of our uh, Bibles, books, religious books, devotionals, and even some curriculum. And again, though those are ways to help these organic communities uh, to stay in contact and connection with each other and to educate them. All right, let's keep moving ahead. Now, as I look at organic communities more, these the the idea behind this is uh, people not the positions are important. Uh, about 10 years ago, we, I worked with a colleague who believed that you had the position and then you would find somebody to fill that position. I don't know, organic community, no, no, let's look for the person first. You know, their people can fit in all kinds of different slots and the people have so many other gifts and abilities that could be used for the organization if we just take the lid off and let them out of some of their slots, especially when you go back to that organizational chart I showed earlier where, where we could have talented people who are buried near the bottom of the organization, and they haven't been able to work their way up to be in a position of power or influence. 
in an organic uh, community, community, the collaborators have a mutual purpose. They have ownership of what the community has decided, and they have a voice. In the, uh, or the uh, organizational chart that I had at the beginning, the latter approach, uh, that's not always true. And, and if you feel like your voice has been heard, uh, you're certainly much more motivated to work with these other people and to take ownership of whatever the project is. Act, uh, organic communities tend to be action oriented. It's, it's not about what your title is. Um, everybody that's in the circle, it's about the project and what they're doing together and, and the action of it. Uh, they are extremely relational. You know, we're hearing for the 21st century, high tech, high touch. High tech is happening right now in this presentation, um, but that high touch part can't be lost. And uh, organic communities offer the high touch as well as, if you're using the internet, the, the high tech approach. And lastly, uh, organic communities, for all the people who are a part of the process, it's meaningful work. There's meaning in the process, not just the product of what you're doing, but it's in the process of working together. If you've ever worked in a group of maybe five or six where it's an organic community, um, it's, it's been said by some that, that once you've had that experience, you, you know, that's, that's the experience you want to repeat. It's difficult to repeat because people are different and organic communities are different. And it's not something that can be prescribed. Uh, it's something that will uh, eventually uh, grow on its own. As a matter of fact, descriptive versus prescriptive, organic communities communities are descriptive. Uh, you cannot order um, a community, a, a small group. Well, let's use this example. I belong to a church where we have a young preacher who believes everybody needs to join a small group. Everybody's going to jump into a small group because we all know that small groups are meaningful. Well, if you're going to order everybody to do it, this is not going to be an organic kind of an approach. He's actually taken a prescriptive approach saying you're all going to join a small group and you're all going to do it that this way. Um, and, it's, and it's probably doomed to fail. Organic communities more tend to happen. Um, they certainly can't be prescriptive, and and by the personalities that you have in your group, um, th that community will grow in its own way. Uh, with this, there are a lot of options, a lot of approaches, a lot of patterns, and they tend to develop naturally. Now, we can apply this to a classroom, and uh, our curriculum are usually prescriptive. But you know, and I know, in a classroom, the it's it, the approaches and the methods that the teacher uses, and the types of methods that that work with certain kids tend to develop naturally uh, in certain kinds of classes. Uh, with this, there's more openings, opens uh, options for diversity, innovation. Uh, innovation, you put a group of uh, creative thinkers together, and uh, innovation uh, tends to happen in a group probably much more naturally than just some individual getting an idea and saying, all right, everybody's going to do it. Creativity is encouraged. Uh, individuality does stay because who the individual people are in that organic community makes a big difference into the personality of that community. And out of it comes a, a wholeness. I work with a group of uh, five professors here at Concordia. We call um, the, them the, they're the elementary education department. And uh, in this group, through the years, uh, it is a feeling of wholeness in this group. There's a lot of support, but boy, each person's individuality comes out strong and clear. Out of it comes this spirit of mutuality, connecting, belonging, and caring. It, you know, it makes you all want to just have a group hug right now, don't you think? Sam Seafeld has raised his hand, it says on my computer. Cool. In reference to the Lutheran system of education and the declining numbers, Sheboygan Lutheran recently has made an effort to broaden their outreach by streamlining Christian education, not necessarily Lutheran education. There has even been discussion amongst leaders to take the cross off their building. Do you think this is a good idea? And if so, to what extent? No, absolutely not. Don't take the cross off the building. Same type of consideration for Lutheran schools going on to the choice program and potentially straying away from a heavy Lutheran core. Well, we, wanted, we would want to talk about about what that Lutheran core means, but uh, take the cross off the building? Absolutely not, because Lutheran education is a Christ-centered education. You're not going to lose your identity there. However, straying away from the heavy Lutheran core, the question is, what does that mean? Let's quote Martin Luther. What does this mean? If the Lutheran core means 
just traditions and some of the rituals that we do that may not have meaning to others, you know, we have work to do to, to, to explain to them what that means. Obviously, though, when people come into a Lutheran school or a Lutheran church, I hope that they certainly feel uh, the spirit of caring, connecting, and know this is a place where they could belong, whether they're Lutheran or not. And uh, that identity part is is huge. Uh, Jesus, if you notice, he didn't uh, have them come to him. Jesus went out to the people. And, uh, and he accepted them as they were. And then it was through their relationship with Jesus that they started to understand what it was all about. That's my sermon. Let's keep going. Sam, just ask more questions. This is this is fun stuff. Okay, organic communities. Personal meaning, not a vague vision. You know, this vague vision thing, oftentimes in the hierarchical kinds of, of organizational charts, the vision comes from on top, the leader. A lot of times it might be from a small group or one person, and they're all of a sudden going to give this vision to everybody. And... Uh, it doesn't trickle down. The personal meaning comes from the people within these organic communities who understand what it's all about, and they have have input into this vision, if you want to use the term. Participants find meaning in the process by contributing ideas, personalities, I've seen some of this before, their experiences, their energy, and their motivation. And uh, that's, that's where the meaning is in the process, as well as whatever the product might be. Now, that doesn't mean, and I want to come back to this part, that doesn't mean it's all, always all about having a group hug. Oh, man, sometimes these organic communities are where some of the most fierce disagreements and arguments can happen. Uh, first time, first meeting that I came to at Concordia in the education division, there were two professors that really got into it over whole language versus phonics. And man, they, it was fiery and I found it extremely uh, energizing. I was so excited to find out what the deal was with whole language after that debate. And uh, in these organic communities, participants are there where they can challenge one another's ideas and uh, the community can grow from it. Uh, that's part of innovation. Okay, let's keep rolling as I watch my time frame here. Um, with organic communities, it's about relationships, not commodities. And let me explain that a little bit. Relationships are measured in stories. And as you notice in my presentation, as I talk about this, I'm, I give you, I'm giving you different stories uh, more than numbers. Commodities tend to be measured in bottom lines, numbers, finances. And a lot of times you'll hear this in church growth kinds of uh, reports. You know, it's about numbers. Oh, we got this many numbers of people involved in small group ministries. Well, in an organic community, the numbers, numbers are a tool, but they cert it's the story that's more important. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was picking up my daughter, Beth, back when she was in the seventh grade. I picked her up, would pick her up from school every afternoon. And uh, I'd say, Beth, how was your day? And in her seventh grade voice, you can probably all say it together, her answer was, fine. And then she wouldn't say anything. So one day I thought, all right, I'm going to try some of this uh, number stuff. So I said, Beth. On a scale of 1 to 10, if you're in a 10 is awesome and a, a 1 is awful, what number would you give your day? Now, that's a tool. And Beth got real quiet, and at first she looked at me like I was crazy. But then uh, she said, oh, I'd give it a 7. And then I said, well, why did you choose a 7? And then out would come her stories for the day to tell me how her day had gone. And then pretty soon, by the next week, she was asking me, well, Mom, what's your number? So I would say, well, let me think about my day. And then I would tell her what my number was. And then I would tell her the story of why I was feeling that way. There, It got to the point there'd be days I'd pick her up, and if I didn't ask her, what her number was, she would bring it up. Mom, aren't you going to ask me what's my number? So, so yes, there is a place for bottom lines, for numbers, for obviously for finances. But if those are the ultimate goal of the community, um, it's certainly not the organic one, which is more about the stories, the relationships, the process. Now, this one's huge. In an organic community, the emphasis would be on editability instead of accountability. Right now, in our churches. Oh, in our schools, I, I can't tell you how many times I hear, oh, we have a leadership crisis. We don't have any leaders. 
And as a director of the Women's Leadership Institute, I hear this from the church ladies all the time. I am not a leader, is what they'll tell me. And as I've thought about it more and more, I, why are so many people resisting leadership? And I would argue it probably has to do with this accountability thing. You're the leader, therefore you're accountable. You're not allowed to make mistakes. You're going to have to put your neck out. And everybody knows that, that we're tough on leaders. Well, in an organic community, that's not what it's about. It's about editability. In an organic community, uh, it's, it's, the, it's uh, sorry, there was somebody at my door. <laughs> in an organic community, it's, it's about we're going to make mistakes. We know that. Let's try some new ideas. They may not be perfect. We'll learn from them, and then we'll go on to our next idea. Instead of this bottom line accountability, it's more of editability that we want to improve, we want to grow, we want to help one another grow, but we will admit that we're going to make mistakes along the way. Does this sound like hippies and a little... Uh, a little uh, touchy-feely, perhaps, but but give me an organic community any day over a top-down organizational chart. In an organi organic community, uh, leadership is revolving. You know, that whole thing about uh, uh, accountability, well, there's not just one leader. There might be somebody who plays the leadership role if there's uh, some kind of uh, emergency, but it depends on what the project is. It's not your position, it's more what your gifts are and what your abilities are, and so leadership can revolve as to what the task is. And so the certain kinds of projects that you create uh, will invite who the leaders will be. It's the project that, that chooses the leaders, it's not the position. And so, and if certain leaders have certain knowledge in a certain area, obviously that would be the task or project that we'd want them to take leadership for. Expertise, their, certain, their abilities, their interests, all of those would open the door for the leaders to step up so the project can invite them to be leaders or they can volunteer. With the idea of editability over this idea of accountability, more people are willing to try it, and especially in a community where there's support and others will take turns. In this is also what's called cross-helping, and if you notice the diagram here with all the different bubbles, you know, just because I have these, these separate little uh, pods, people can bounce between them depending on what the, the project is. And as a matter of fact, it's good to mix these groups up at different times with different projects. And so it's the project that holds the power, it's not the person or that person's position in the organizational chart where the power will be. Out of this, is, and, and the ideal is synchronicity. And, and the best example I can give of this is if you remember seeing the movie uh, Witness with Harrison Ford, remember when they're, the Amish are building their barn? And everybody has certain jobs to do, and that barn goes up, and the women are making sandwiches, and the kids are there, and the men are all, and up goes those barn raisings in no time flat. Of course, it didn't hurt that they had the music in the background as they're building the barn, but that synchronicity that happens in an organic community with the project and everybody chipping in, oh, it's, it's, it's the ultimate. If you want, you want a uh, product, that's, that's one of them in this process that just takes tends to naturally happen. Um, it's also generative, and that means once you've had success with a project, it's that quick the new ideas are springing for what we're going to do next. I mentioned this group of uh, five professors that I work with in the elementary department. At the end of the semester, we have what's called the mystery tour, and the five professors who work with this cohort of students, um, during exam week, the five professors plan a field trip for the students, but the students have no idea where we're going. And as the five professors get together to plan it, uh, somebody takes the leadership at different times because they have a new idea. And, in, and it happens invariably every semester that as we're planning the one mystery tour, we're already getting excited about the one for the next semester and where we're going to go and what we're going to do next. Uh, it's generative. It, 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 it tends to feed on itself. Uh, with, with organic communities, the emphasis is on abundancy and not scarcity. By abundancy, um, 
the answer is yes, let's try it, versus no, this will never work. Oop, Dr. J's class says, is there potential then for a school to shy away from having one principal? Oh, Dr. J, you're always thinking those things. If so, what type of leadership do you foresee? Uh, I actually, I'm comfortable with the school having a principal. Absolutely. It's just that it, it's the principal's not sitting in the middle of the circle. The principal sitting around the edge, just like everybody else. Yeah, just like uh, the principal is going to have certain duties. Somebody's got to do those paperwork duties. Uh, somebody's got to do the emergency thing. Uh, they, perhaps you could have shared jobs. A lot of schools do divide some of those. So you'll have your curriculum uh, person. Uh, some of the larger schools, well, Sheboygan Lutheran, don't they have an executive director and then they have a principal and then you have your a guidance counselor, you know, but you could still have those kinds of projects for specific people. It's just that uh, others are there to cross help and to build off of ideas with one another. Uh, I, I know it always throws you a bit with the idea of losing these positions, and I'm not talking about wiping out all positions, but I am talking about wiping out the extremism of those organizational charts that tend to happen. The, and, and what tends to happen in those organizational charts, the top-down uh, approach, is you'll see more and more layers get built into that organizational chart. And with more and more layers comes less and less communication, more and more silos of divisions of where th there's, there's less and less... Uh, communication going on. You hear that all the time, by the way, in those big organizations. We just don't communicate. So uh, it doesn't mean that, that jobs like the principal would disappear, but it does mean that there would be a lot less layers. And with those layers come more and more paperwork, uh, less and less trust, I would argue, because it's easy to isolate yourself on that ladder with your job description and not have to, to talk to other people. Okay, so now let me see. I got more questions. Dr. J's class. Uh, Bernard's typing. There are some schools that no longer have principals. They run using teams. All right. Yeah, I know of a couple of schools where there's a, and usually it's because of Lutheran schools where the principal left, and so there's a couple, there are a couple teachers who have divvied up the principal's jobs, and they work together. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what I think, but, but they're headed in the right direction for an organic community. Uh, Dr. J's class, a few schools in Italy, for example, do that. All right, I, I don't see why not. Uh, yeah, I've been the department chair of the elementary education department. I do make final decisions but on some things, but it certainly it wouldn't be hard for any member of my department to do it for me because they know, they know pretty much how it goes. Why? Because we do a lot of communicating. As a matter of fact, our walls are so thin up here, half the time we communicate right through the wall. <laughs> Okay, with that said, so the answer for an organic community is the emphasis is on this idea of abundancy. The answer is yes, let's try it. And, uh, and, and you're hesitant. I'll be the first to tell you that sometimes there'll be a group, <laughs> there'll be a member of our elementary block professors who'll say, let's take the mystery tour here. Or let's go there. And I'm hesitant. I'm wanting to say no. It's, it sounds like a risk. Um, but I've learned that it is an adventure. Last year, Dr. Kuiper decided that uh, we were going to investigate some caves in Wisconsin. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a cave in Wisconsin, but it's not like Mammoth Cave in Kentucky where everybody stands up and has a flashlight. No, we were crawling on our bellies through bat stuff and mud to get from one one little tunnel to the other and we were all there doing it and I got to tell you it was an adventure and it's something that none of us have forgotten so the answer is yes let's try it innovation does come out of it possibilities it just keeps you thinking of more possibilities and where you can go next um, oh man just about any book you read today that's futuristic that's looking at 21st century to compete with with in the world market anymore uh, it's going to take innovation you know the, there's that the whole new mind book that's by uh, pink and he's talking about how right brainers are going to start to uh, have to kick it in because the future is for the right brain and that means innovation and adventure possibilities. Uh, let me give you another example of this abundancy scarcity thing and I'll go back to Chester, Illinois. Uh, they got this small school. It is declining. Everything I've described is exactly what's happening back at, at my old little elementary school and my mom just uh, 
just came from a voters meeting. My mom's 82 years old, and in the voters meeting, they wanted to give the teachers a raise. And mom happened to be sitting next to the principal. Mom knows that they can't make the budget right now the way things are. And then she voted no because mom came from this idea of scarcity. We don't have the money. We can't give the teachers a raise. And she just said she could she could uh, hear the principal just kind of groan when he saw that she even voted against the raise. And it bothered her so much that she went back to talk to him about it. And as she talked to him, uh, he understood where she was coming from, and she was coming from this idea of scarcity, not the idea of the possibilities, the innovation, the adventure, and abundancy. Uh, well, I could go on that topic even longer, but, but we're going to keep moving here with this presentation because I have six minutes left. Oh, let's see. And I'm right near the end, so, so this, is, this is working out pretty well. Okay, let me see. Dr. J's class. Is the PLC approach a hybrid approach between organic and old school? Uh, PLC, professional learning community. You know, I think the professional learning community is trying to, uh, yeah, I think hybrid is probably a, a, um, a good way to look at it. Actually, you know, Concordia. Uh, we are a uh, old school, top down organizational chart. And yet, out of that, we were able to create this organic community of the block professors and the elementary program. You know, my, I would advocate that uh, this happens all over the campus, that, that we would start to, and I think there should be a lot of cross-helping, by the way, if you're looking for innovation. I, I think one of the things that Concordia would, should do is, is take a look at some of the innovation, pro, innovative professors from the different programs, put them together into an organic community, a think tank, if you will, to, to take a look at 21st century schooling and how can we do it better. Uh, I think this is good for any any faculty anywhere to do, to put those teachers together and uh, take a look at how can we do it together. Let's do some innovation. And this is where the principal is in the position of leadership to have this start to happen. In these Lutheran schools that are declining, that are that are that are uh, they're cutting not back on teachers and they're down to maybe five teachers that, you know, if I were a consultant for them, I would have those teachers in a room and I'd say, all right, times have changed. Now, how can we, by working together, start to make some changes? And uh, the research uh, supports it, that you don't have to have first grade, second grade, third grade. The old uh, one-room schoolhouse, to some extent, was an organic community. The older kids helped the younger kids. The younger kids that could read helped the older kids. Cross-helping was going on, and learning was going on. Um, let me see here, as I near the end. What does this mean for leadership in our uh, LCMS churches and schools? Well, Ken Blanchard, another one of the gurus here, uh, says leadership is the ability to affect how someone thinks, acts, or develops. Now look at that definition again. Leadership is the ability to affect how someone thinks, acts, or develops. Who's that sound like? Well, in my life, it sounds like mom. Mom affects how someone thinks, acts, or develops. And when we look at our Lutheran schools and our Lutheran churches, I mean, it's mom who decides if those kids are going to attend that Lutheran school or not. And so the question is not just for our schools, it's also for our churches. And I am the director of the Women's Leadership Institute. You know, if mom's on fire in our churches, her kids will be in the schools. And uh, I think this whole idea of leadership here, affect, it's, it's about verbs, how someone thinks, acts, or develops. It's not about a position on an organizational chart. And uh, one more Ken Blanchard thing, 70% of effective leaders in organizations have no leadership positions. And here's why, Dr. J, you could sit around one of these circles in an organic community. You don't need a title. Dr. J does not need a title. He will be Dr. J no matter what the kind of governance is and uh, because you are a natural leader. Um, resources. Here are some resources that, that you might want to take a look at. Jim Collins, Good to Great, and I'll put in my one-minute plug here. If you've read this book, you've heard about Jim Collins' quote about getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. Uh, 
Now that the idea was originally you wanted to get the right people in the positions that that who would be talented and so that the bus could get going. I I got I have a problem with the bus analogy, and that my problem is because there's only one driver of the bus. And if you think about the bus, think about who sits in the back. So let's go back to the 1950s, and uh, it was minorities. And uh, today, take a look at organizational charts, and at the bottom of the organizational chart, you'll still see a lot of work, uh, minorities and women. Um, and the people in the middle of the bus, they behave themselves, they look out the window, but they're pretty much being taken for a ride because uh, the driver obviously is in charge. He's got the mission, the vision, where they're going, and maybe there'll be somebody sitting up their shotgun to, to read the map for them. Uh, in an organic community, uh, maybe the bus would be like a Flintstones bus where uh, everybody's out pedaling. Remember those Flintstones buses where there were no wheels? <laughs> Everybody's, or maybe it's rowers. I don't know. There's got to be a better analogy because in an organ, in an organic community, um, everybody's involved in the leadership. Uh, Thomas Friedman books, bo Friedman's book, The World Is Flat. Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, is is very good. It's a new one that's just out. He brings up the point of this power thing where they now well there were plane crashes and they started to look at why the planes were crashing what was going on and they'd listen to the flight report and it turned out that the co-pilots a lot of times knew, were aware that the pilot was making some wrong decisions but the co-pilots were afraid to question the pilot because he was in the power position today the rules have changed and now if a co-pilot notices that the pilot is making a mistake the co-pilot can take over uh, I also plugged my which are basically those were organic communities at the beginning. Reggie McNeil's The Present Future, excellent book. Uh, many of the things I'm talking about today are from Joseph R. Meyer's book, Organic Community, Creating a Place Where People Naturally Connect. Um, Daniel Pink's book there, The Whole New Mind, is also a great one. Oh, Cynthia Barton Robbie, the, I've just finished this one, The Innovation Killer, and it talks about why we crush innovation in a lot of our uh, companies, and uh, also very good. And lastly, Margaret Wheatley, Leadership in the New Science, that's the one where she started to talk about quantum physics and how it looks like chaos, and truly it's not. There is a pattern that's going on. And it is quarter till six. I'm going to say goodbye. Um, organic communities and Lutheran, 21st century Lutheran education. Uh, my presentation is completed. If any of you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. I'd love to continue this discussion. Um, thanks for paying attention, Dr. J's class, and uh, over and out.